So welcome to ELT in Chile, a podcast about teaching English in Chile. In this space, I talk to teachers, t- teacher trainers, and experts who would like to share their experiences and expertise regarding English language teaching. So in this episode, I'll be talking to Mark Hancock. So Mark started teaching English over 30 years ago and wrote his first English language teaching book, Pronunciation Games, over 20 years ago. And I think that's a book that many of us have seen or have used. I've used it myself when I was, you know, I started teaching probably like ooh, almost 10 years ago. His most recent book, Connected Speech for Listening, provides ideas and tips to improve students' listening skills. Uh, here, I, as you can see, I have his latest book, which is super cool. And I'm going to say, let's say a few more things about that book later. So his approach in both teaching and writing LT materials to, is to engage the learner and inspire their interesting interest in the content and the process of the lesson. This is driven by his belief that teaching and learning and language can and should be an enjoyable experience. He studied geography and philosophy at St. Andrews University, followed by teacher training courses and finally an MA in teaching English from Aston University, Birmingham, right? Mark has studied in Sudan, Turkey, Brazil, and Spain, and currently lives and works in the UK. In his free time, Mark plays the saxophone and the guitar, paints in oils. I've seen some of your paintings, which are super cool, and also walks in the mountains. So welcome to Ulti in Chile, Mark. Thank you for accepting my invitation to the podcast. I have many questions yeah. for you, so let's get started. How are you, Mark? Yeah, I'm, I'm very well, thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to, to be with you in Chile today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I hear we're enjoying our winter and you're enjoying your, your summer. Uh-huh. It's the longest day of the year in, in, the, in Europe. <laughs> yeah. So a long day. It was uh, light at uh, five o'clock this morning. Long day. <laughs> Well, it's quite the opposite, but very good, very good. So let's start with the questions. Uh, well, usually we ask, let's say, our guests, um, especially how they become, you know, teachers or how they become involved in, let's say, teaching. What about you, Mark? How did you become interested in actually involved in teaching English? Uh, well, I think um, liking different languages is a part of liking travel. So uh, ever since I was very young, I, I've always wanted to to know the world, to to, uh, to go to other places. Um, obviously, if you go to other places, you're going to find yourself with other languages. Other languages, fascinating to me. So it's sort of natural that I should get involved with languages, both learning languages and, and teaching English. Teaching English is also, by the way, a pretty good way of going to other countries, of getting work in other countries as well. So it has that other benefit. So that I started teaching. As soon as I left university, I uh, went to teach in Sudan, in uh, in Africa. Uh, there was a, an opportunity there. Okay, it was basically voluntary work, but still it was an opportunity to go to Sudan and I really wanted to, to visit that place. So that's how I started teaching. Uh-huh, very good, very good. Well, like I said, let's say in the in your introduction, uh, you've written many important books. Probably, you know, people may remember, uh, you know, uh, one of the the first books I've actually seen, and I remember using that in class when I was starting, you know, my teaching career, Pronunciation Games, <laughs> and I remember that book, let's say, very fondly. Also, you know, I've used in class English pronunciation in use. I know you've written, let's say, English Result, and a really interesting series called uh, Prompt Pack. Actually, I have, uh, let's say, those books, and I've been using them in class. But I would like you to tell me a little bit more about your first book. I don't know if it's your first book, per se, but maybe one of the maybe, uh, most popular ones, Pronunciation Games. What can you tell me about that book, and how did you, let's say, start writing it, or what made you write that book? Yeah, well, it was published finally in 1995. Uh, it's, um, it's still sells today so it's pretty unusual for book to have such uh, longevity and uh, like you say I, I've noticed that a lot of people remember that book they say oh Mark Hancock pronunciation games it's uh it's it seems to have hit the spot but uh, it started um when I was working in the Cultura Inglesa in uh, in Brazil and uh, I didn't have a, sp- a specific Uh, interest in pronunciation at the time. I was just uh, an average English teacher. And they said, well, you've got some administrative hours. uh, So we're going to ask you to make some materials for teaching pronunciation. And so I was like, oh my God, I I don't know anything about pronunciation. (laughs) 
<laughs> so I had to le- learn a lot about it right there and then in order to, to do my job. And um, obviously, uh, I was looking at these books like um, <clears throat> Jimson's um, Pronunciation of English and th- these kind of academic books. I, I'm thinking, well, this is really difficult to understand. How, how, could, how can I make this more accessible to other teachers and to students? How can I make it even something enjoyable rather than something stressful? Uh, and whilst I was wrestling with that problem, I grew to, to love the topic myself. Sometimes you, you get to like something by doing it. And that's mm-hmm. how it worked with me. <clears throat> so yeah, I started making this material in the early 90s, 1990s. <clears throat> Eventually I came up with uh, enough material to, to publish uh, a book. In fact, I was uh, at a conference in Santiago in Chile and uh, somebody in, at the conference said, oh, you should uh, publish this, this material because I presented some of the material at the conference. And, uh, and so that's what happened. I, I took it to some different publishing houses and finally I took it to Cambridge University Press uh, where the editor at the time was Lindsay White. And she said, well, this book's terrible, but I think you could make it good. Uh, I think we can make it good together. Um, <laughs> <But that's, laughs> well, it's an excellent feedback for the book. <laughs> yeah. So that's how it worked. And uh, a couple of years later, then finally it was ready. This was uh, all writing by, with a pen on paper because I, I wasn't able, I didn't have a typewriter and computers didn't exist. So it was writing with a pen, pencil, pieces of paper, sending it to a typist who could then put it together to send it as a proposal. Uh, we had to suffer for our art in those days. Yeah. Nowadays, it's so easy. <laughs> yeah, you can create basically anything, which is like maybe some maybe a website or, of course, with some specialized software. Mark, there you make, let's say, a very inter- interesting point, which is, um, you know, the, the 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 theory behind phonetics and pronunciation, which is, which is, let's say, quite interesting, but it's also quite theoretical and complicated sometimes. And the, one of the problems might be that that transition from how do I take all this fantastic scientific knowledge into the classroom. So maybe that was one of the challenges that you saw. Uh, that's why maybe you kind of started writing about pronunciation. Once you start checking some books and you say, well, this all makes sense, but for students to understand this, it must be so complicated. Yeah, and there's also, you have to ask yourself, is this really necessary? There are some aspects of pronunciation and you think, well, I can get away with not doing that and people will still understand me. So why is that important? Uh, I think uh, people need to be selective with pronunciation or uh, any other aspect of English, in fact. Uh, You don't have to regurgitate everything that you know about it. There is a temptation if if you've had to suffer to learn all of this stuff yourself when you were when you were studying uh, you when you, if you've had to learn all of these facts about phonetics there's a temptation to then pass on that to your students whether or not they want it or need it and uh, I think um, the secret is to to know more than you tell uh, you, you you shouldn't try to transmit everything. Just be selective and choose what's more important uh, for your students in, in terms of being intelligible. Yeah. What, yeah. Yeah. What do they need to make themselves understood? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. That was a, let's say, interesting way to explain how you, let's say, become, how you became related to let's say maybe how you had started writing materials to, related to uh, pronunciation. So I would like to show, let me be the, you know, the latest books, this one right here. Uh, so let's say, what can you tell about this book? Let's say, what's the rationale behind writing the, this book or why you think maybe connected speech for listening? Why specifically, let's say the, this, this topic? Well, uh, connected speech 
features of connected speech, uh, things like uh, linking, linking between words, uh, elision, cutting sounds, uh, vowel reduction. Um, these kind of features are not necessary for intelligibility. You can speak extremely clearly, articulating every single letter perfectly, and that's intelligible. It isn't necessary to reduce your speech as, as people tend to do. Um, so I think you, there is an important difference, therefore, between receptive and productive pronunciation. There are things that students need more because they're going to hear them and in terms of their listening skills that's necessary. They don't necessarily need to produce these things in their own speech. It, it isn't necessary for you to, for example, uh, grade down a student who doesn't use elision. Yeah. If they don't use elision, fine, no problem. Is, but they're going to, as listeners, they're going to come across it, so they, they need to be aware of that. So connected speech for listeners, if, if that's the reason for it. Connected speech is not so important for speakers, it's important for listeners. And tying in this feature of pronunciation specifically to the receptive skill. Um, uh, it is true to say also, though, that sometimes by trying to say it to yourself, it, some, it makes you better at perceiving it as well. So I don't think it's a bad thing to get your students to say phrases with connected speech, but this is not for the purpose of making them say this when they get outside the classroom in their normal English. It's so that they're going to be more hyper aware of those features as listeners yeah. and that's the purpose of it and also yeah let's say by raising awareness like you said i agree with that it's not necessary for them to produce them but maybe having let's say or being aware of that these feature exists maybe they are going to try to produce it but it's not let's say unnecessary but i've seen many people you know uh, also in classes or in, in usually in class they say Teacher, what's uh, I've heard that when I was doing some research, they talk about, I don't know, glottal stop. When is it used? When is it not used? And you can, of course, share a few things, but because they, or sometimes they're watching a movie or a series and then a TV series and people start saying that it's like, oh, that's where it's it's found, you know? So they start finding the, the, those things or like you said, like maybe connecting sounds like, you know, did you or would you or things like that. And then people start, let's say, realizing that, but it's not necessary for them to actually produce them, which is, let's say, an interesting point. I mean, it's not necessary to teach them how to, you know, uh, use elision, like you said, or assimilation, or maybe some other, you know, aspects of connected speech. Uh, well, they, they, some some of them are really difficult. You, yeah. you mentioned the glottal stop there. Yeah. Um, for example, let me tell you a little bit about a little bit, a little bit, a little, 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 little. Yeah. The double T and little. That's a yeah. typical place where people might make a glottal stop, certainly in British English, in American English, it might be little, but uh, if, if I had a student who, who is need, needs to understand the British accent, I would want to teach them about yeah. the glottal stop because it's Absolutely. so common yeah. in a British accent. Uh, students that I teach, for example, here in Chester, in the UK, they're living in an environment where on the street, they're going to hear people speaking with a lot of glottal stops, And uh, I think uh, they're going to be grateful if you can explain a bit about that to them in the class, because that, then they'll be more aware of it. What, what students tend to do is they blame themselves. They think, uh, I, I, I don't understand what that person says. It's because my, my, my hearing is poor. It's my fault. Uh, if you explain these things of features of connected speech or glottal stops as you mentioned if you explain these things to them then they go ah so it's not me it's them it's, it's, that's that is what they're saying uh, so 
then they can they don't have to blame themselves for everything yeah absolutely well that's something that probably if you take somebody who's been learning english and then for example if you take them to chester probably they're going to have or they're going to experience this kind of shock you know that maybe they, they, they would say things like I'm, i don't understand this or what what's wrong with me because i cannot communicate let's say very well but yeah there are some features there that are specific to that region or that to or that to maybe a specific town or even you know or maybe a city so that, that's something that also we need to emphasize when teaching pronunciation of course and listening skills as well trying to develop that uh, yeah I mean, there's uh the accents that your students need to understand is very important i think that students should not expect there to be only one accent as you say different different cities different regions different accents they're going to come across different accents and there is no one correct accent there's no there's no there's no sense that just teaching them about one accent is, yeah. is, it, that's not going to help them in in the real world in in, the, in this country for example in britain um we have the prestige accent rp the term is often used as a model in teaching but uh, something like three percent of people inhabitants of this island speak with that accent so when when people come here expecting to hear loads of people speaking like the queen then it's going to be a, a surprise for them when they arrive and find that uh, very few people speak that way <laughs> you, you need to be tolerant of different accents and you need to uh, build students build that tolerance up in your students using for example, audio material, which has different accents in it, that, oh, that's going to help. Absolutely. Yeah, we're going to talk about a little bit about that later. But yeah, that's a very interesting topic. Uh, Mark, are you working on any other materials at the moment? Any, I mean, any, any workshops or research projects? Or are you writing any books? Well, I, I have a course, um, which I do twice a year with a colleague in Brazil, Taylor Vega. Um, And that starts in July, July 17th. If anybody's interested, look on uh, the website pronforteachers.com. Yeah. Pron, and then the number four, P-R-O-N, number four, teachers, pron for teachers, pronforteachers.com. Yeah. Actually, uh, that yeah, starts on the 17th. Yeah. Yeah, if you want, we I can share that website, uh, let's say on, on let's say on my social media and also on our website. So we'll be glad to do that. Uh-huh. So that's that's one thing. Uh, that that's a, a course that lasts uh, what two months uh, or so. Uh, I, so I do that course twice a year, and uh, I do a similar course with a colleague in in Argentina, Stella. Um, that happens in in the summer, your summer. Um, apart from that, well, I'm writing books. I'm writing another book just now for the Pronpack family, uh, concerned with. Uh, spelling and the correspondence between spelling and pronunciation. It's going to be a, a difficult one. <laughs> It's difficult. I've just got myself a big fat new book with all of the rules of English spelling. And it's a, it's a beautiful thing. I love to have a, a big fat reference book. Yeah. Um, it's a great investment because you don't just read it once. You read it you again and again yeah. and again, and you're constantly referring to it. So I've got another book like that. And actually, I'm happy yeah. to say. Um, uh, there is one book of, of, of this series, like the one you just mentioned, which is called um, Pronunciation of English for Spanish Speakers, which is number five in the series. Oh, so, yeah. Right. So yeah. I, I strongly recommend And I'm going to share, let's say, uh, your website so you, they, people can see your books. But that one is specifically for people who speak English. Sorry, Spanish. Yeah. Well, I lived in, um, I lived in Spain for a long time, like 20 years. Mm -hmm. So... Uh, Uh, that was something that uh, I really wanted to to focus on specifically because it's a it's a great thing to focus on your your learners' needs in yeah. detail. A lot of books that you find are generic for for a global market, and uh, and so they they don't uh, get close up on the details of your of your learners' first language. Yeah. I think uh, if you're teaching pronunciation. It's really important to uh, learn as much as you possibly can about the student's first language. If you happen to speak it yourself, yeah. then that's a great advantage. Uh, you're, you've got um, 
a head start. If you if you yourself are a Spanish speaker and you're teaching Spanish speaking students, that's a that's a great thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, let's say previously in the interview, you mentioned that let's say some teachers tend to be reluctant or they kind of avoid teaching pronunciation. Why why do you think this this happens? Oh, because also let's say I, I would say I would I have heard the same thing about listening that some people are reluctant to teach listening. Some people let's say it would be like teaching listening would be like just playing a tape or playing you know or showing a video. So why do you think let's say many teachers take that for granted that pronunciation is something that's going to be developed you know organically when especially when the teacher is the main pronunciation model for the student in the classroom. Yeah, maybe they don't uh, assume that. Maybe they just. Uh... <laughs> They just stick their head in the sand. They they just don't want to know about that. They just uh, cross cross your fingers and hope for the best. Because the trouble with teaching pronunciation is, like I said before, it's uh, when you do it, maybe if you study it uh, during uh, Philologia Inglesa, maybe it was something very theoretical and difficult. Maybe you had trouble with it yourself. Maybe you have a certain insecurity about your own accent people have insecurities about their accent uh, i understand that uh, yo hablo en español claro es que he vivido en, en españa muchos años pero uh, mi acento es terrible claro uh, we all have this terrible uh, insecurity about our own accent uh, the thing is it's totally inappropriate um, to have that insecurity, given that uh, English and Spanish, they're both global global languages, yeah. have a big reach. English is a, a global lingua franca yeah. used by um, so many, many, many more people than come from an English-speaking country. Yeah. Um, People who don't come from an English-speaking country who speak English outnumber uh, the native speakers by much. In fact, so much so that the word native speaker doesn't really make sense anymore because the language is not the property of England. It's the, group, yeah. it's the property of the world. It's your language too, Jose, if I may say so. Yes. You you yourself are no less native uh, than me in English. It's a global language. It belongs to all of us. So there's no reason why your accent uh, is any better or worse than mine for teaching pronunciation. We're, it's it's fine. If you're an intelligible speaker of English, your accent is as good as anybody else's. Anyway, that's not um, the attitude. That's uh, the, the attitude is, I think, possibly influenced by the academy in Spanish, for example. Yeah. Academia Español. They, they, they have an official pronunciation, which is the, one, the correct one. In Spain, they say the correct pronunciation is uh, Salamanca or Valladolid, um, one of those accents from the north part of Castile. Uh, and even people who don't have the accent, people from Andalusia, for example, they, they agree that the correct <laughs> one, I, I don't speak correct Spanish, the correct Spanish is the one is from the one. Valladolid, uh, which is a ridiculous idea. It's ridiculous. It all comes back to having this academy that sets the rules. And then in society, generally speaking, people have this idea, there is a correct version of my language. I don't think that's true or relevant. It's, it's, simply, it's simply, who says, who has the right to say that my accent is better than yours or vice versa? Yeah. Actually, nobody has that right. It's a question of, does it work? Does it function? Does it get your point across? Absolutely. And um, I think it's uh, fortunate that, for me, that English doesn't have an academy um, like Spanish. Yeah. So um, I think uh, 
there is less uh, temptation to, to, to believe that there is a single correct version. Although I will say that the Queen uh, has, been, has been taken as a reference point. Some people talk about the Queen's English. English yeah. But that's all to do with, that's all to do with um, prestige and um, power, something political, really. Yeah. And I think it's I think it's, it's it's going out of fashion. People are not as sycophantic towards uh, the aristocratic accent as they used to be. I think it's become, in terms of accent, a lot more democratic than things used to be. I'm not saying that there isn't accent prejudice still, but but it's uh, it's much lower down. People used to actually uh, go to classes to improve their own pronunciation. I mean, talking about English people learning to improve their own English pronunciation. It was called elocution. That's how important it was regarded as. People don't do that anymore. Uh, very few people do that. Actually, yeah, you mentioned an interesting point related to, you know, Spanish, which is, you know, uh, I, I, we, I hear that a lot. It seems like, you know, uh, for Chilean people, uh, there, there's an opinion that, Uh, shared by by some people, not by me, but that we speak poorly, like that our accent should be improved and there are more beautiful varieties of Spanish. And that's something that I usually tell students, like, don't ever say that again, <laughs> you know, because it's like something that's like per, uh, perpetuated through basically, this is like cultural thing, you know, people just repeating that without any linguistic basis. And, and also, and, uh, you know, also regarding English, when people would say things like, Yeah, British English is more formal than American English or North American English. Or, and we have this conversation, how can, can it be more formal? Like, can you please explain that to me? And then we have, let's say, these conversations. And, uh, you know, but let's say that's why pronunciation is a very, you know, touchy topic or, you know, for people, it can be a very sensitive one because, but there are many misconceptions as well. You know, like we take all of these huge opinions, let's say, for granted and we, we we don't really have the time to analyze them or when somebody studies linguistics you you have to talk about these things you know i think uh, one of the um, misconceptions about pronunciation that people have which is really important uh, relates to the uh, behind me uh, for the people on the podcast uh, behind me you can see a, a load of uh, phonemic symbols um in a chart And uh, let me just take, for example, the one that uh, looks like an E followed by an I. A, yeah. A this, uh, is a diphthong, A, that symbol. People, people uh, I think, believe that these symbols represent a very specific sound. <clears throat> And I think that's a misconception. I think they represent a place in a system. Yeah. Is this one, sim one symbol is different from the other. It's the difference that matters, not the exact sound. So for this particular sound, A, as in the word face, or the letter A in the alphabet, A, this, is, this could be pronounced in different ways. In Australia, for example, they might say I. Yeah. Or in Scotland, they might say air. Which one of those is correct? Yeah. All of them. All of them are correct. Exactly. And that's simple. That symbol, the E followed by the I, can represent all three of those uh, different uh, versions that I just gave. The symbol doesn't, doesn't specify one particular accent. We shouldn't regard these symbols as specifying, for example, RP. Yeah. No, it's the, it's the system of distinctions between the sounds that matters, not the exact quality of each individual sound. If you imagine that the, sa the sounds in the chart are like a, a box of chocolates, yeah. we tend to look at the chocolates, right? But we should really look at the box. It's the box that that's more important, not the actual <laughs> thing that goes in, in the box. It's a very good analogy. <laughs> And uh, Mark, in your experience, uh, what, some, what are some of the challenges that teachers face when teaching pronunciation? What are the main difficulties, maybe obstacles that you have encountered, you'd say, when giving workshops or when you try to teach uh, teachers, of course, how to teach pronunciation more effectively? Uh, well, uh, 
there's something, uh, for example, intonation. Let's just mention intonation. Intonation is uh, super difficult because uh, speakers, uh, I'm talking now about the, the tones, the rising and the falling tones, that aspect of intonation. People, people actually use intonation uh, subconsciously. And uh, it's a kind of, it's like a, a gesture, like a facial expression. People not, not necessarily, they don't train, you don't train your facial expressions. They, they just come to you uh, despite yourself, by accident, you may say. And the same goes with intonation. So when you're trying to get a, a teacher, you say, okay, here you have to say it with a, a rising intonation. And they say it with a falling intonation. You say, no, no, you say it with a rising intonation. And then, uh, and then you demonstrate it for them. They say, no, but that sounds like a falling intonation to me. You know, you can't even agree on what you're actually hearing. Yeah. Um, so there's that perception thing. That's uh, that intonation. It may be the most difficult aspect. Sorry, what was the question again? What aspects are the most difficult? Or let's say what challenges the, are the ones that teacher face when trying to teach pronunciation. So you, you mentioned one. Mm -hmm. so well, intonation, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, more generally, there's the, what I mentioned before about being selective, which bits are going to be relevant. Uh, and also there's the, the question of um, identifying what your students need. Mm. For example, sometimes they may your students might pronounce something uh, wrongly and you you you're you misdiagnose it let me just give an example uh, the word the fruit pear yeah. pear and the student may be said peer yeah so it, it rhymes with ear yeah and you and that would be natural because if you look at the spelling e a r it makes sense it makes sense <laughs> right so and in fact it's perfectly possible the this is not a pronunciation problem in the first place. It's perfectly possible that this is a, a problem of spelling-induced error. Uh, so if you, as a teacher, uh, then launch into some great big long explanation about how to move your mouth, uh, 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 try how to move your, put your mouth in the correct position to make that vowel, you're missing the point. The point is that they're, they're simply misreading it. They're, they're being influenced by the spelling. So there's a big difficulty then in diagnosing the diagnosis of the student's problem. Make sure that you've got the diagnosis right. Don't um, be, start teaching something that the students don't have a problem with. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a big thing. That's a big difficulty, the diagnosis aspect. Um, well, anything. no, I think that those are interesting points because I mean that's that's that specific word like pair, you know, which and then you have the problem, of course, with with I don't know with bear or with bird or with beer or with beard. Those are problematic words, you know. People usually get them wrong, but you cannot just say yeah. You you would be focusing on the wrong. You would be emphasizing the the wrong aspect, which would mm -hmm. be say because they are trying to the students are basically trying to make sense of the language, how it works, you know, and, and that's why when I was saying that you're working on the, the connection between spelling and pronunciation, because that's a, a very a problematic one, you know, it yeah, can also yeah. be a little uh, chaotic, I would say, you know, when it comes to English and, you know, recognizing that and trying and trying yeah, to so basically pronounce that. Sometimes we just uh, focus on the wrong thing. Um, we, we get tempted into talking about the wrong thing. Um, and Things like um, the uh, vowel sound in pair. Mm -hmm. In my accent, it doesn't have an R, right? But yeah. in, in Scottish or American, then there would be an R pronounced there. And it doesn't matter which way you do it. Probably better if you pronounce it with the R, to be honest, mm -hmm. because uh, that's going to be more intelligible, probably, globally speaking. Yeah. But the fact is, if, if you uh, uh, go, oh, but I have, to I have to pronounce it just like on the tape, and on the tape they say, pair so you're going pair and the student goes pair 
And you go, no, you shouldn't put no, the R in there. That's that is not the point. It doesn't matter if they put the R there. Or so uh, then you're you're grabbing onto the wrong thing. This would be a mistake in my in my opinion. No, it's a, just simply a distraction. You go, well, okay, you say it like pear, I say it pear. It's fine. Both of those is fine. Don't waste time on something that's not a problem. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think that's a very, I think we should print that out, you know, <laughs> that <Yeah>. phrase. <laughs> very good, very good. And actually, yeah, Mark, I would like to share something with you. My own experience as a teacher and researcher, you know, I think we talked about this a little uh, a few minutes ago. People have strong opinions, you know, uh, especially when it comes to, to to accents, right? And my own Latin experience as, I'm, as a teacher. And many students say that they need to improve their pronunciation or they would like to improve their pronunciation or their accent. That's what they, they would say. And actually I carried out some research in 2017 with a colleague of mine, Nicholas Gunn. And we, we interviewed, I think, 65 pre-service teachers, English teachers, right? And something that came up, I mean, it was not like a surprise, but 98% of the students we interviewed wanted to improve their pronunciation because they felt it was not good enough for them to teach pronunciation. <laughs> so let's say when we saw that number, we were, Let's say I would say surprised, but we kind of expected it. I can share this piece of research on our website as well. But let's say to us, uh, seeing that everybody, almost everybody said that their accent was not good enough, you know, because otherwise there would not be a good pronunciation model for the students. Mark, why do you think this happens? Why do you think, uh, let's say, let's, I mean, this number is so high that maybe for us it was surprising. Maybe I don't know if it comes as a surprise to you as well. Uh, no, I think it's, uh, it's part of that insecurity that I was mentioning before. And I, I've, I've written um, a couple of articles on this topic. I wrote uh, in pronpec.com, uh, for example, there was an article called I'm an English teacher, should I worry about my accent? Which is exactly on that topic. Uh, and another one, pronunciation models and false choices. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, basically, the, the idea of a pronunciation model that isn't you, the teacher, is I, I'm not sure it's, it makes much, much sense. You as the teacher, you are basically the model in your class. So... If at the beginning of the course you say to the students, okay, which one do you want to learn, British or American? As if there were only two. Yeah. And as if either of those were standard. But it, it, that question apart, would it be even possible for you? For me, for example, if I said to my students, okay, which one do you want, British or American? If my students said, Uh, we want American, please. I would have to say, well, I can't. I'm sorry, I can't do that. <laughs> so I cannot teach this class then. <laughs> yeah. So basically, you you you're the model, no. and and that's fine. If you're an intelligible speaker of English, you're a good model. No. So um, it, uh, people are, are obsessed with this idea of a model, and I think it's it's a lot to do with. Uh, old-fashioned prejudices. So I mentioned before that RP in Britain is uh, the accent associated with uh, power, uh, wealth, influence, mm. historically speaking. So uh, there, there is a certain snobbery in British society associated with that accent and if i have the feeling that uh, this um prejudice this snobbery has been exported to the world and um, people maybe in chile maybe people might say ah i've i've heard that rp is the is the uh, is the gold standard the perfect accent um well basically that they're, they're repeating the uh, the prejudice Yeah. that has, has been um, grown up in, on this small island here. Yeah. Um, the idea of a standard, standard sometimes has a double meaning, right? Standard can mean all the same, 
yeah. or it can mean class quality exactly and uh, there's a mix mix up of those two things there's the idea that a standard accent is somehow better quality and it's not the case that's not true um a, a, a standard accent is arbitrary it yeah. was just an accent chosen at random pretty much or for reasons that have nothing to do with yeah. intelligibility exactly yeah and a lot to do with um power and social class so um we need to separate this idea of standard and quality in fact i think we can take the whole question of which is the best model put it onto a second into the second position because it really it's really you the teacher you are the model and are you an intelligible speaker of english if the answer to that question is yes then you're a good model yeah um there's no reason for example why um english with a chileno accent is in any way inferior to english with a italian accent mm. a russian accent an english accent an american accent um australian accent whatever it's, there's no reason whatsoever in fact in reality if you're a teaching in chile a chileno accent would be a, a really appropriate model for your students because that's it's the kind of accent they're more likely to to develop in any case yeah given their own background um and if it's a perfectly good accent then why not why not have a, an accent why why not um build on our strengths rather than punish ourselves for our perceived weaknesses build on our strengths our strengths are we can speak english intelligibly this way so let's do it this way why not why not why do we have to speak somebody else's way yeah That's which is the actually, way they speak somewhere else which is actually much more difficult to i mean it has to, it depends on your let's say skills basically your articulation skills and if you are able to produce those sounds to be a successful speaker yeah also, yeah and and also let's say talking about the 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 previous point rp is really prevalent here is, uh, in chile like universities you know and i would say like in latin america as well like when i talk to colleagues from other countries they would say that when they let's say majored in you know efl or maybe when they wanted to become teachers that's the, the the varieties they had to produce were you know two idealized versions you know rp and general american of course and uh you know this is something that if you did if you were not able to produce them you would actually fail a course or you would have let's say problems you know uh, or you would not be um your pronunciation would not be good enough or your sounds would not be good enough yeah it sounds to me that that's um um uh, a product of the of the necessity that institutions like universities the necessity they have to uh create grading and marking schemes the the necessity of evaluating students performance um how do you evaluate somebody's accent mm. well it's a difficult question and the easy answer is is to is to steal the prejudice from one of the donor countries yeah. um the donor countries being England or United States. Yeah. Um, we take 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 uh, the uh, don't the prejudice of the donor country. England, for example, has this prejudice towards RP. So maybe uh, institutions around the world go, okay, so which is the best? Well, they say it's RP in England, so let's say it's RP, <laughs> and that's yeah. going to be the. That's going to be the, the grade that we're somebody, going to... Yeah. Some, yeah. Say, somebody saying that, so let's just re repeat the same idea, basically perpetuate the same myth. Yeah. But it's people, and this idea of evaluating and qualifying, this is uh, all to do with assessment. I see that people have a need for assessment, okay. Yeah. But um, it's really, really shallow to assess pronunciation in this manner it's it seems to be a short cut an easy easy um, response to a difficult question um 
really, if we're going to evaluate somebody's pronunciation, we need to be getting at intelligibility. What is it? What is it about their accent that's intelligible or not intelligible? Are, you know, are they intelligible? How intelligible are, are they? Um, one of the things that they need to do to be able to be intelligible, for example, is to, is to distinguish between the sounds in words so that the words sound different. Yeah. So different phonemes, they need to be differentiated. Okay, it doesn't matter. Like I said before, it doesn't matter necessarily the exact sound that they create for that phoneme. What matters is that they distinguish between that and other phonemes. That's all about intelligibility. And the fewer distinctions they have, the less intelligible they're going to be. Yeah. Uh, so you need to make your assessment grading based upon that kind of uh, criteria and not on whether they're good at imitating yeah. um, the queen. Yeah, yeah. Are we, are you, that's, um, that's a skill to do more to do with actors. Acting, actors yeah. need to learn, or spies, they need to learn that kind of skill. <laughs> but your but, students yeah. don't. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it would be. I mean, those types of goals are, let's say, in a way, like unattainable. I mean, I mean, probably so people can actually, you know, attain them. But like you said, they have to do more with acting skills more than actually, you know, yeah. skills. And you have to think about why your students are learning, don't you? Yeah. Uh, I, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, of all of the school children in Chile who are learning English. Are they learning English in order to go to Buckingham Palace and meet the Queen? <laughs> Is that the reason that they're learning English? All of them. Imagine the entire population of Chileno skilled children arriving in Buckingham Palace one day. Um, this is <laughs> clearly a nonsense. Yeah. It's nonsense. Some of them may visit yeah. the UK at some point in the future. That, that could happen. I guess the majority of them won't. It's a long way. Um, some of them might go. Uh, but really... In truth, that isn't the reason that they're learning. And that's, I think that's a mix-up. Um, if, if, for example, you think of a small a language which isn't global, is not global, like Dutch yeah. from, from, from uh, the Netherlands. In Belgium, it's, yeah. uh, it's not widely spoken outside. So if you're learning that particular language, it's probably because you're planning to visit that country, or, or possibly there, live there, there, live there, right? Okay, that is not patently not the case with English in the world today. Yeah. Yeah. All of the people learn English, only a minority of them might be uh, thinking of going to live in uh, an English speaking country. Yeah. So why are they re really learning English? Yeah. Is to, to gain access to the global community and the global community doesn't speak with RP. No. No. Yeah. Like you find people from many different countries trying to communicate with English as a lingua franca, right? And, exactly. Yeah. And also, I, I like the idea of the word standard because standard, like you said, has different meanings. For some people, it might be like everybody is speaking the same or using the same accent, but also standard as being something better or, you know, superior, which goes against the word standard but again like i under, uh, you know like uh, understanding that point like and like you said who decided that it was the correct standard and it doesn't make sense especially in this globalized world like you said probably people here in chile mo most of them well like you said i think there are two big groups people who would like to study abroad and live abroad uh and the other group is like people who work here in chile with uh other people who speak in english as a first or second or third language basically so, but mostly in a work, you know, related context. Yeah, even if you're going to um, study abroad, uh, th that example that you just gave, going to study abroad, maybe you're going to study abroad, but not necessarily to England, right? No, you no. yourself, uh, you went yeah. to Belgium, right? Yes, I went to Kowloon, and, and yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, the, the courses were offered um, in English, and uh, yeah, I had to prepare for international exam, but yeah, they did not, were, they were not evaluating or assessing my, my accent. Yes, I was just wondering how many people in uh, in Leuven speak with an RP accent. I didn't find many, but I would be interesting. <laughs> I'm going to ask, let's say, what my former classmates. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it was you know. Well, well, 
I'm assuming that uh, <laughs> it's not relevant. No, of course not. Right, because uh, it's you're you're speaking a, a lingua franca, yeah. and uh, in in a lingua franca, everybody's accent is equally valid. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's a very interesting point. And let's say, Mark, yeah, let's try to maybe to finish up this conversation. Uh, what resources or alternatives can you suggest for teachers who are, let's say, watching and listening to, to this podcast? Let's say in terms of pronunciation, of course, I would recommend your books, of course. This one is super cool. <laughs> Any other maybe suggestions that you may have? Uh, well, I'm just going to start um, with... You know Ayatafel? Ayatafel? Yeah. Do, do you know Ayatafel? Yes. I, I don't know. If, is, it, is it well known in Chile, Ayatafel? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, there. Uh, we usually have... National like, Association. Yeah. Yes, uh, a conference like Ayatafel Chile. So there was one chapter here that was part yeah. of... Yeah. Exactly. So Ayatafel um, has a, a, a PRONSIG, Pronunciation Special Interest Group. Um, So that's a really good resource. Um, you, there's a lot of material. If you go to YouTube, for example, and you type in PRONSIG, PRON, S-I-G, uh, you can see all of their history, backstory of webinars, right? And there are lots. So it's a, a great resource. That's even without becoming a member. If you become a member, there's more. But uh, so that's a, great, that's a really good uh, resource. Lots of material in PRONSIG. If you become a member, you get uh, uh, a good um, periodical as well, which has had most of the cutting edge articles from the last uh, 30 years uh, in it. So you can you can read the back articles from that. So that would be uh, my number one um, recommendation here. Um, And yeah. the second one, your books. <laughs> well, I could say my books. <laughs> <laughs> And, um, and, talk, yeah, and, and let's say, uh, and my websites, the two websites, maybe uh, you could send them around or put yes. them up, share them later. Yeah, because there, there, there's quite a lot of material freely, freely downloadable for teaching pronunciation on on both of those two websites. Yeah. Okay, very good. And probably that's the the place where people can also find your books or where to find your books on your It's website. A, Things are a lot easier in terms of pronunciation nowadays than when I started writing before the age of the computer. Uh, now there's uh, some massive re resources available for you to hear, for example, different accents around the world. You've got uh, things like YouTube. Yeah. Um, here's a great, great thing you could look at. Try Uglish. Yeah. which is uh, connected to YouTube, Yes, it's a, but it's an app, Uglish, yeah. and uh, you can just write in a phrase. Uh, let, let's say the last one I wrote in was um, <laughs> uh, give them a, three words, give them a, because I wanted to hear what proportion of people cut the TH sound yeah, of them, them. Yeah. so give them a. So I wanted to, I wanted to, research that so i type that phrase into uglish and then you just hear people hundreds that, yeah. of people from different uh, uh youtube videos so you see the video and you can hear them say that a phrase you hear a little bit before it and then you hear that phrase, the phrase and then you hear a bit after and then you can press fast next and you go to the next one and you hear and you hear the same phrase by different people, different speakers, different accents, different, different speeds, context, yeah. different level of formality. And this is really great because the essence of listening or pronunciation for listening is, is to build up what John Field would call mental traces, yeah. uh, a, a background of experience of having heard that phrase. It's as if, he, he says, it's like you have a, a mental recording of everything you've yeah, ever yeah. heard. Imagine, right? So uh, the more you've heard, the better you're able to understand the next time you hear it. Yeah. And so you, you get used to these differences. So experiment with Uglish. But yeah. there are plenty of um, apps and stuff available. In fact, uh, the latest webinar from uh, the PromSig um, was by uh, 
Beata Valesiak and uh, William Gotardi, and that was about um, uh, tools on the internet for working on pronunciations. So that would be a great thing to go and have a look at the, uh, the recorded video from that webinar. There's loads and loads of recommendations there. Actually, I, I, I've been using your wish, let's say, for, for quite some time. And uh, there was one of the main, let's say, exercises was to look up or let's say, try to find the word. How do people pronounce Chilean? Do people say Chilean or Chilean? Because if you look at the dictionary, both actually exist. But let's say, yeah, the conclusion was that many, most people say Chilean more than Chilean. <laughs> so, okay. you know, it was kind of funny because most people expected Chilean, let's say Chilean, sorry, to be more and more, more frequent than Chilean. But it was after, you know, watching probably or looking at a hundred people pronouncing it, it was, you know, more, <laughs> more, most people would say just, uh, let's say Chilean. So let's, that's a very cool tool, you know, like to use, uh, it's a very active and people would yeah. just like watching videos, like you said, with different types of context. So people didn't used to know how to pronounce chili when I was a child. Uh, we used to pronounce it like uh, chili, which yeah. is like uh, cold. Yeah, yeah. A little so, bit cold, yeah. an adjective <laughs> meaning cold. Yeah. Chili. Yeah. Uh, when I uh, finally met somebody who who, who spoke sp Spanish, Spanish and they said chile, I was ah oh, right, of course, yes. <laughs> It makes sense. It makes sense. <laughs> now, but yeah, we have many jokes with the word Chile. It's Chile and Chile, of course. <laughs> but yeah, it makes sense. So, Mark, thank you very much. And that concludes our video episode with, with you. So thank you very much for taking the time, for accepting the invitation, You're welcome. for having this interesting conversation with me, uh, sharing your experiences and ideas and, you know, hearing from you. Um, what do you think about accents, you know, pronunciation and, and listening. So if you have any questions and comments, you can reach us at podcast at ELT and Chile .com. And don't like, don't forget to like and subscribe. And you can visit also our website, www.eltinchile.com. So Mark, I don't know if you have any closing remarks, but thank you again. No, that's it. That's all from me. <laughs> Thanks for inviting me over. It's been a pleasure to uh, revisit that country, which I, I, I know quite well. I've been all the way from Punta Arenas to Arica. I've seen the whole length of the country. <laughs> <laughs> you've seen it probably so. more than let's say more than <laughs> most people yeah it's a very long country and people do not realize that once they let's say people look at a map and they they think it's and you know it's it's not that long but yeah it is yeah, you need long. a long a long piece of paper to draw a map actually <laughs> <Yes. laughs>